current environment. We are no longer using the word boom, we are using the word gloom. How much of the current environment is largely driven down because of sentiment? How much of the word slowdown is structural and how much of that is uh, cyclical? So um, let me start by uh, giving my perspective. Um, so I was reminded of a, you know, so this, I was in the United States uh, around 2008, 2007, 2008 and was visiting India, you know, visiting family. So was, you know, on a flight and there was a, a senior executive sitting next to me, happened to be in conversation and the person said, effect, I'm just sort of summarizing and you know, maybe, maybe misquoting a little bit, it's been, a, it's been a while, saying, you know, we don't need to do anything, we'll continue growing at 9%, 10%, you know, India is happening, right? You know, forget about doing reforms, of, you know, obviously he didn't say it that way, but you know, come what may, we're going to grow at 9%, uh, 10%. Remember thinking that, you know, if only it was so easy. The reason I'm bringing that up is, you know, we tend to, um, you know, in, in India oftentimes sort of oscillate between irrational exuberance and, and excessive pessimism. Uh, and, and, you know, therefore it is the duty of someone like me to, to try and, uh, you know, provide the perspective that the truth is somewhere in between. Um, neither was it as hunky-dory as it was at, you know, after doing nothing. And I think now, now you know, the, the, the evidence actually shows indeed that um, starting around and, you know, when I actually look at the sort of the last, you know, 15 years, I, I feel that we took off the, you know, took our eye off the ball on, on, on you know, structural reforms required for growth, you know, into around starting 2004. Um, and, you know, without getting into specifics, but I think that that is something was an important. Um, I must, in this context, mention that, you know, that, that the government in the next five years is clearly focused on economic growth. Um, I, and I, you know, for, for, the, for the benefit of, of all the viewers, I must mention, the day after the budget, the Honorable Prime Minister made a speech where he used an expression that a University of Chicago, you know, uh, graduate would have been really proud of, saying the size of the pie matters. That's the exact word that he, the you know, exact phrase that he used. And, and that is basically saying that we now need to focus on economic growth. Um, so I would actually say that, you know, that as we say in Hindi, sabra ka fal meetha hota hai. Um, it, there is absolutely, you know, no, uh, doubt in in our minds that we really need to focus on growth. Um, the, there has been a phase, you know. I think um, you know, last five years we've put in some of the important, you know, um, reforms. I would specifically mention about the bankruptcy code. I actually spoke about credit culture. You know, I, it, it there can't be a credit culture in a country without having a bankruptcy code. Very very important. And you know, again, just for the benefit of viewers, it's important to, so suppose if somebody, you know, one of us takes a car loan and we are told that the, if you stop repaying, the car will not be repossessed. You know, while many of us may actually feel a moral obligation, on average, some people will say, if I have no threat to basically losing my car, why should I repay? And that is where the bankruptcy court becomes really critical for the credit culture. So there is, there has been, you know, there has been clean up because Clearly, starting around 2008, 2014, there was excessive leverage that was built up. Um, other aspects, which I don't, don't you know, um, reflected in the corporate balance sheets, reflected in the, in the, in the, in the, um, you know, banks' balance sheets as well. And that if the ramp up, you know, and, and some of the sort of the difficulties that were created at that time, if that happened over a seven, eight year period, to expect that that unwinding of that will happen like this, I think one is not being very realistic. So it's important for that process to, 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 to sort of continue. I think in this context, I must mention again in the Independence Day speech, the Prime Minister very clearly mentioned that wealth creation is something that is very important. Uh, wealth creation is important because, you know, think about an industrialist who actually has wealth. It's not as if that person is sticking, you know, the wealth basically in notes under, under his pillow. That, that person is basically employing that, you know, in, in the form of capital, you know, assets which are actually bringing jobs. And that is, that's a perspective that is really important we should keep in mind. But at the same time, I would also mention, so we clearly, you know, need wealth creators and we need to respect wealth creators. But at the same time, the wealth creators also must understand that wealth creation has to happen in the right way. 
uh, and you know, th I think that emphasizing that is important as well. So, uh, you know, th this is a process that actually we should wait for it to basically, you know, for, the, for it to come to a logical conclusion. You know, as economists, we always say we always have two hands. There are no benign options. If, if you have to do some of this, you know, the, the, the cleanup, it will basically run, it, it have to, has to run its course and there'll be some, you know, uh, difficulties in the short run. But let's, let's acknowledge that, you know, in a globe, in a world that is struggling to grow at even two, two and a half percent, you know, if we are able to put things in place, even while growing at actually a little lower, I think that is something that is important. That is something that we should let that process continue. What role do you think PSU banks will play? How committed is the government in order to reform and recapitalize the entire PSU banking sector? Because there's one merger which has happened. Some would argue that that was more like a forced merger. So I think, um, you know, there was an important change that happened from, you know, from uh, um, 2014 onwards, which is that the commercial decisions that the banks basically had to make, it was left to them. I think that is, you know, in order to understand the importance of this, you know, I have to actually go, rewind back and say, you know, nowhere in the world do bank, commercial banks go and lend to, to, to infrastructure. And there are two very good reasons why that, that, that doesn't happen. One, you know, it creates a huge asset liability mismatch. Second, the ability to judge a good project, you know, infrastructure project, something that is really long gestation, that is very specialized expertise, and, and banks do not basically specialize in that. And so I think it's, while it may seem now as something that is we take it, take it for granted, I, I think, you know, the fact that commercial decisions is something, you know, that banks basically get to make on their own. Even for instance, if you take, you know, we keep talking about, oh, let's say there isn't enough transmission. But, but that is the banks are making those, that decision on their own without basically fiat being sort of, you know, run through. That's the flip side of, you know, and I think that is an important piece of, piece of um, reform that has happened. Um, overall, I think the, 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 the governance is something as I actually spoke about, you know, um, wh whenever we look at, you know, across the world, any crisis that we've seen, be it the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, you know, eventually when the, when the verdict comes out, there is actually a huge element of governance in it. And I think that's what even our own experience over the, from 2008 onwards, actually the ramp up in credit, where the quantity happened without the quality, which also had to do with governance. So I think the emphasis on governance is actually very important in the context of public sector banks. But I'll let me sort of, you know, t take a more big picture view, not just focus on the public sector banks, but as I'd mentioned, I think we do need more you know, more sort of uh, uh, um, catering of, of banks to the, you know, to basically the credit needs of the country. Um, I think, you know, f for instance, I mean, many, uh, many countries now, you, you have actually, there's talk about like a Netflix model, you know, something, and, and Netflix, like, you know, starting to, let's say, maybe becoming a bank, right? Um, and, and these are disruptions that are happening. Uh, FinTech is, is here. Uh, so uh, the, the emphasis on use of technology, is something that is really critical, you know, um, needs to happen across the board. And, and our banks need to really sort of go and, you know, uh, rather, than, rather than get disrupted, they need really, really to sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, take that on board and, and run with it. Uh, I think a good point that you made, and I must uh, bring that with your permission. Sure, of course. <laughs> up is, you know, the credit culture piece. You know, in the credit side of any banking, uh, there are six C's which are important but one of the main C's is character. So I think addressing the character of how the banking industry or consumers behave, I think is a co-foundation of the future. Because you can only have problems for a few years, but if you don't address it, I think it'll only be a downhill path forever. So I think addressing credit culture is crucial. The one thing that I've read recently, which I thought I'll take your thoughts on, is there is a discussion around a personal insolvency code and a fresh start. Now, why I bring this up is last time when the demon happened, there was a discussion where the Reserve Bank said for 90 days, you don't have to classify the NPA. Now, that was between the Reserve Bank and the banks. But what happened is the vested interest came in, started collecting people and saying, you don't have to pay. My worry again is, if you don't communicate this well, while we have done a lot on improving the credit culture, this insolvency personal code with a fresh start may give these Western interests another chance of spoiling the character. 
So in the end, while we're trying to help, we may actually move backwards. So it'll be nice to hear how you all are thinking of fresh start being important. It's, it's crucial in many ways. But how does it not stop or rather make it worse, uh, both for banking and of course for customers? Because in the end, they will lose when the banks back out. Well, I, I think what you've highlighted is, of course, a, a very, very good point and uh, something that it's, it's a nuanced point, right, which we economists use these two Latin terms, ex post and ex ante, uh, which is after the event versus before the event. Um, and these kind of dynamic effects are the ones that are usually very difficult to communicate. Um, but it's really important, you know, as a policymaker to try and communicate this. So when you, you know, um, once a borrower, let's say, is in trouble, you know, to possibly make some exceptions, is exposed, right? Maybe good, you know. But what it does for the credit culture is basically the exante effect. And, and that is something which is really important to keep in mind. You mentioned productivity and in your opening remarks you also mentioned the fact that it is widely believed that the private sector is much more efficient. What are your broader thoughts on the way how uh, government business have been done? Is there a very strong thought which says that government needs to vacate a lot of spectrum in some of the, when I say spectrum ownership, in a lot of businesses? No, I, I think if we, you know, look at um, recent uh, steps that have been taken, uh, the fact that public sector entities now, you know, can basically go down below 50% at 49%, um, and that the, um, you know, that ownership can be counted not only of the government but other government entities as well. I think that's a very important, you know, a very important step. There's something that that sort of gives away, you know, what is the line of thinking the government is 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 having on this, and 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 they've now, you know, we we need to basically focus on that, we need to follow through on, 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 the, on that particular policy measure. But overall, I think the recognition is clearly there that, um, that, that you know, we need to sort of enable the, 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 the private sector. For instance, the, you know, the, 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 the Honorable Prime Minister talks about saying, you know, we need to en sort of ease of en doing business, ease of living for citizens needs to be, and that is primarily when, when the you know, focus is on ease on doing business, it is about enabling the private sector to do business, you know, business well. And, and, and clearly this, these are steps that, you know, the vision is definitely there and, um, and, and, and the efforts to try and follow up on the vision are also, you know, uh, uh, being made. We'll see the results actually in, you know, in, in uh, very, very soon. <laughs> Any follow-ups? Yeah, um, just one observation and then a quick uh, follow-up for the chief economic advisor. See, the one of the things that clearly we realize is, and in our business, that urbanization has an advantage. So a lot of focus, we, a lot of folks will, you know, move to the urban locations. There'll be jobs, and there'll be work. But frankly, 1.2 billion can't. That can't be the answer. Banks like ours will reach out deep, rural, create opportunities for people to borrow from us, to create small businesses, to create employment, and then grow. You mentioned tax ops. So one of the questions is... No, I didn't mention tax ops. <laughs> oh, I heard tax ops. <laughs> I heard uh, lower taxes, I don't know why. <laughs> no, I, I mean, there has to be somebody who's optimistic. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the way I thought I was thinking about is, really, as we go deeper, the one of the big challenges banks would have is, you know, breaking even in a branch takes about two years, three years. You're really servicing a part of society which is not normally easy to service, and we haven't done that in the past. Would the government think of something more deeper to do with banks like ours, when I mean like small finance banks, which will really go deep into land, and with some amount of support from the government, really make a difference to societies that are there? And there is enough opportunity. I mean, we work, for example, in dairy farming. I mean, just productivity that you can produce there. I mean, the productivity that you do in the agribusiness. The amount of education you can spread where people can really use it even for a very distributed data entry operation. So there is a lot of opportunities. It's just that how do you create a platform where you encourage the private sector to really go deep down? Because there is an answer there. So, uh, you know, I have actually two responses to, to, to this question. Um, one at a more philosophical level, um, 
I, I would say that the, you know, the, the, the private sector in India now, you know, since 1991, we basically are almost now 30 years. So we have a 30 year old kid. And um, yes, among that, you know, the, there, are, there are basically um, younger kids, no doubt. Um, but a 30 year old, um, you know, man, adult needs to, you know, now start saying, okay, I can stand on my own feet. Um, you know, I, I don't need to keep going to Papa. Papa mujhe ye de do, Papa mujhe wo de do. Um, you know, that, that is something which is, you know, really important to, and, and but, but let, let me be, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, for, for even a moment, you know, dismissing what you're saying on, on, I think financial inclusion is very, very critical, is important, but this message of, of, of basically private sector cannot have a situation of, of, of you know, of, of private profits and socialized losses. I think that is, that needs to basically move on. We need to move on. We are now, we are a market economy. In a market economy, you know, assets do get reallocated when somebody doesn't, you know, let's say manage the asset very well, reallocation needs to happen. Uh, there are sectors that basically go through sunrise and then have a sunset. And sunset sectors, basically, there are, you know, reallocation happens. These are important aspects. So the private sector also needs to recognize that, you know, the mindset needs to change from, from basically as whenever you actually are, let's say, having a difficulty, keep going, um, you know, keep crying, you know, basically running, uh, running to, to, to Papa to basically, you know, saying, Papa, uh, you know, that, that, that needs to also, al also change. I think that's an important mindset change that needs to, the, the, and, and relatedly, I'd actually, you know, comment on, you'd mentioned, for instance, about the, um, about yeah, Jana, for instance, if it is a small problem, you call it a crisis, and if it's a crisis, you call it a tsunami. I think within an organization, you know, that's, that's, that's absolutely fine. But if, for instance, and, and, and I would strongly urge our viewers today to actually read an excellent op-ed that Dr. Arvind Panagariya, the former, you know, vice chairman of Niti, wrote in the Times of India today. It's, um, I think it's, a, it's an excellent read. Um, that that it, it's, if, if it is, you know, a reflection of genuine difficulties, I think that is fair. But, but you know, when there is actually, let's say, a motive for, for you know, for, for talking about those difficulties, I think that part is something that we need to sort of, that's, that's the habit that I spoke about. We need to inculcate some, some good habits and get away from bad habits. And uh, the, the message that comes out of Dr. Panagaria's article today is a good habit that, that we must basically think about inculcating. That's a philosophical point. Um, now the, but you know, lest it is actually said, oh, this is an academic talking about philosophy. No, it actually is something that really matters for the economy. Just because I'm saying that using the word philosophical doesn't mean it, it doesn't have implication. It has real implications for the way we do business in this, you know, in, in, in India. So it's very important. Uh, the, the, the more limited point about, you know, some, some, you know, world over sunrise sectors are sectors that actually can, you know, be, be, um, can become subjects for, for support. I, I mentioned, I think already that when, you know, infants should be supported. And, and, you know, one can definitely think about financial inclusion as an industry, some, as, as something that possibly, you know, belongs in that category. But again, this is something which needs, needs more thinking. Again, you know, I, in terms of the sort of the spirit of what I've spoken about, I think financial inclusion is certainly an area that, that fits that bill, but, but needs to be thought through. I must mention, you know, we do have, for instance, priority sector lending, right? And the ability for, you know, for, for institutions like yours to basically go and trade on the, you know, priority sector lending that you do with, with banks. So there is already some, you know, sort of incentive that is being given, but you know, should, should more be done? You know, I think maybe, maybe the answer is yes, um, but, but uh, it's a question that actually needs more, more careful thought. We say that, uh, you know, technology has to be explored versus the job creations. And we are talking about $5 trillion economy. So from an economist point of view, how do you see this contradiction, so, so to say? I think that's, an, that's a very good question and something that we are very cognizant of. of um, I would request you to go and take a look at the first chapter in the economic survey where we've actually, um, you know, addressed this. Um, 
usually th this is the narrative that is you know that's spoken about for and i'll give an example just to uh, it, you know illustrate um, the the concern that is being so many of us would have actually gone and you know gone into a bank when there were tellers to to withdraw money um, when that you know the tellers basically got replaced by atm machines and that is an in sort of a phenomenon that is used to say look you know technology is is basically uh, you know is is is, um, is is leading to job loss because you have the teller activity being replaced by the atm machine what, I, what is important to recognize here is that this is, it's a partial view. Why? Because when you actually talk about the ATM machine, in, you know, getting that ATM machine, somebody had to go and do an R&D, basically do research to first, you know, discover the ATM machine, somebody had to develop it, you know, a set of people would have had to manufacture it, there would have been factories, and there are people required to ply cash, actually, you know, from, from um, you know, to, into the ATM machines, people who actually guard that. So overall, if you look at, if you just look at a piece of that value chain, which is just take that teller activity and say, look, that teller activity has been replaced by technology you will make the inference that yes technology is is basically leading to job losses but when you look at when you take the entire value chain into account it actually enhances you know jobs and that is we provided this i've, I've given you anecdotal evidence uh, here using this uh, but in the survey we actually have provided aggregate evidence across several countries over several decades that actually increase in investment rate in an economy reduces unemployment and and it's something which is very simple to understand because you know unless there is investment you know capital investment that basic people have to work on then you won't have enough jobs either so investment is really required this is what we spoke spoken about the virtuous cycle which is required and you know I, I'll, I'll just take a minute to talk about because it's so important so when we set out to write the economic survey and said okay we have to achieve this five trillion dollar goal first thing we did is okay what can we can we lay out a blueprint and for that, we did the following exercise, starting from the period after the Second World War. We looked at all countries and kept basically two filters, saying we'll take any country that grew at 6% plus over at least 10 years. So, th and then said, okay, among all these countries over periods, that this is a set of countries that grew over a sustained period at a good growth rate. And said, now can we go and look at what is it that these countries did right? Turns out that, you know, and that is why, why basically we talked about this virtuous cycle. The one thing that comes out really clearly across these countries, across time periods, is that it was basically investment driven, especially private investment driven. It starts with investment that enhances productivity. You know, investment actually enhances productivity and as simple as to make that, to, to understand that, the fact that you all are here actually listening to some of us for maybe of a couple of hours, basically you're learning something and hopefully, you know, and thereby becoming more productive. Any investment essentially just makes you more productive. So investment enhances productivity. Increase in productivity increases wages because finally wages are linked to productivity. Productivity also increase basically creates jobs in the economy, brings exports, and that's what creates purchasing power that affects demand. And demand is what then leads to actually anticipating demand, firms invest more. One of the key things that stood out, and this is something which we really wanted to clarify, is that this talk about consumption as the driver of demand, that works very well when an economy crosses the $10,000 GDP per capita threshold. But before that, till that economy becomes developed enough to have $10,000 as the per capita, when you look at it, it is investment that really drives growth. Consumption acts as a force multiplier indeed, but consumption is not the, the, basically the key driver of growth. And that is really important for us to understand. Therefore, investment is what is really critical for us to be able to actually create jobs in the economy. And, and so let's not sort of, you know, uh, the evidence is very, very clear that if we have to have jobs in the economy, we have to have investment, private sector investment and productivity and thereby creating jobs in the economy.